Coming in at second place at nearly 13% of the desktop computer market, Apple's macOS is a reasonably popular operating system, with plenty of dedicated fans behind it. Financially, Apple is doing better than it ever has before, but in the 90s, that couldn't have been further from the truth. Between increasingly unpopular products like the Newton and the Pippin, and the continued rise in popularity of Wintel computers, it seemed like all of their product lines were collapsing at once, and even Apple's cash cow, the Macintosh, wasn't immune. To really understand the issues with the macOS, though, we have to go back at least 10 years earlier to the introduction of the Lisa. Being the first computer Apple released with a graphical interface, the machine was quite the powerhouse, with a 5 MHz processor, dual internal floppy drives, and 1 MB of RAM. Of course, the machine also came with a $10,000 price tag, over $25,000 today. Needless to say, the Lisa did not do well, but a very similar project in Apple was able to see some success. The Macintosh was designed to be a more affordable Lisa, and at a quarter of the price, it had sold almost as many units as the Lisa had in its entire lifetime, in just one month. Of course, to drop the cost as much as the Mac did, a few corners had to be cut. The Mac, for example, had only a slightly faster processor than the Lisa, a single disk drive at less than half the capacity of the Lisa's Twiggy drives, and probably most notably, only 128k of RAM. To pull this off, the Macintosh operating system needed to be pared down as well, so features like protected memory and multitasking had to go. Given a few years and a few increasingly powerful Macintosh models, the Mac had for the most part caught up hardware-wise with the Lisa, but with the exception of the incredibly limited desk accessories, the macOS wasn't really designed to run more than one program at a time. The solution, hacked together by Andy Hertzfeld, was inspired by a similar program found on the IBM PC. Switcher, eventually called MultiFinder, would allow the user to load and unload programs from memory, so that by clicking in the top corner of the screen, the user could quickly switch from one running application to another. It didn't require much modification to the Mac operating system, but still managed to achieve true multitasking. Apple included it with System 5 and onward. It's worth noting that, in the mid to late 80s, Apple was constantly pushing out updates to the Mac operating system, to the point where a new version was essentially an annual occurrence. Besides adding things like MultiFinder, though, the updates were mostly bug fixes and adding support for new hardware. Following the release of System 6 in 1988, things began to slow down, and it would be another three years until 1991 when System 7, a major overhaul to the macOS, would come out, introducing, among other important features, a cooperative multitasking model. One of the consequences of a cooperative multitasking model is that the programs in it have to, well, cooperate. That is, the operating system gives complete control of the computer to a program with the expectation that that control will eventually be given back. Theoretically this works as each program takes turns running on the processor, but this model completely falls apart the moment one program refuses to give up control, usually because it's crashed before it could return to the OS. Because the computer is stuck in the crashed program and the OS can't regain control, none of the other programs can run either, so the moment one program freezes, it brings the entire system down with it. This wasn't much of a problem at first, but as programs became more complex and better hardware allowed users to run more programs at once, the chances of a system crashing bug occurring became greater and greater. The macOS wasn't the only graphical operating system on the market by this time either, let alone the only multitasking one. Windows had started out in 1985 as a crude graphical shell to DOS, and while the second version, and even more so Windows 3 in 1990, expanded it into a more fully featured operating system, there were still plenty of inconsistencies, unintuitive controls, and legacy specifications that made it look pretty clunky compared to macOS. Microsoft recognized this, of course, and after catching up significantly with Windows 3.1, hoped to close the gap completely in the next few years with a little project called Chicago, what would eventually be known as Windows 95. Management at Apple wasn't oblivious to these issues, though, and as far back as 1988, a team had gathered together to discuss the future evolution of the macOS. Easy short-term improvements to the OS, like adding color, were written on blue index cards, while more advanced features, like adding a new, more stable, preemptive multitasking system, went onto the pink index cards, with extremely long-term plans going onto the red cards. The pink and blue goals were eventually given to the pink and blue teams, which would work in parallel to produce the next two versions of macOS. All of the ideas from the blue team became the massive overhaul System 7 that I mentioned earlier, but things didn't quite go so easily for the pink team. In 1991, the same year that System 7 had shipped, CEO John Scully made an offer that would have largely been considered heresy 10 years earlier, and reached out to IBM to work together on Apple's next generation operating system, a project that came to be known as Taligent. 
Since the pink team, and with them the next macOS, had moved mostly outside of the company, not much was being done regarding the future of the operating system, with most improvements being through patches by the blue team that continued to stress the already unstable System 7. Of course, letting the OS become less and less stable wasn't much of a concern, since Telligent would fix it soon enough, right? Wrong. The Telligent project itself was a disaster, specifically because of fighting between the Apple and IBM employees over the suspicion that IBM would end up taking control over the project from Apple. What would become a self-fulfilling prophecy, as Apple backed out of the deal in 1995 and IBM finished Telligent to less than mediocre reception. And there Apple was, with an increasingly unstable operating system on one hand and their four years of backup work down the drain. They needed a replacement OS fast and in doing so cooked up an infamous little project known as Copeland, codenamed after the composer Aaron Copeland. Claiming to have essentially a complete OS rewrite out for developers in 1995, ready for public release the following year, the task seemed impossible, and that's because at face value it pretty much was. Instead, the first stage of Copeland was just to introduce a kernel to the OS, adding in preemptive multitasking instead of the unstable in-place cooperative model. At the same time, to avoid having to rewrite all of the existing system code and libraries, all old Macintosh code will be run in a virtual memory location called the Blue Box. After that release shipped, Apple would rewrite all the Blue Box code and transition fully to the new platform. Of course, just like with Talogen, things weren't quite so simple, but this time, the problem was mostly within Apple. Copeland was the project to be on at Apple, so it wasn't uncommon for developers from side projects that had started in the Talogen days to want to leave those projects to be involved with Copeland. The managers, in interest of self-preservation, attempted to counter this practice by adding their projects to Copeland. That way nobody left, and the developers would still be happy to be working on a piece of Copeland. As 1995 went on, this practice became more and more popular, as the scope of Copeland became more and more bloated. The next year at the Worldwide Developers Conference, around the time Apple had planned to have Copeland publicly released, they showed a demo of Macintosh System 8. It wasn't pretty. Most of the OS lacked basic interactions like text editing, and the system was so fragile that demo staff had to be on hand just to replace hard drives that the system corrupted during a crash. Said one commentator, it was incredible they even let us see the beast. As if Copeland wasn't already a victim of feature creep from internal politics at Apple, the fact that the system was already late prompted Apple to justify that by promising more features, with the then-CEO Gil Emilio in the middle of the conference allegedly promising symmetric multitasking, a major design change by the end of the year. Of course, to implement those features, more time would be needed, and with each delay, Apple would promise even more features. By some miracle, a developer release of Copeland went out a year late at the end of 1996, but the software was so buggy that the OS could just crash from sitting idle. There were suggestions that Copeland would be out by 1997, though officially the release date was just sometime. It was apparent to Emilio at that point that the fragmented development of Copeland was unlikely to ever coalesce into one revolutionary operating system, and so he called in a friend, Ellen Hancock who had worked with Gil at his previous job bringing National Semiconductor to profitability. If anyone was going to get the Copeland dev team back on track, it was her. Hancock's first decision upon seeing the state of Copeland was to call it off. There was no future for the OS currently being developed, and Apple should instead consider buying an existing operating system and reworking it into a Mac OS. A few offers were brought up, like B, created by Apple veteran Jean-Louis Gasset, which was too expensive, Solaris, a favorite of Hancock but largely seen as unworkable to Emilio, and Apple's version of a deal with the devil, <gasps> Windows NT. Avoiding the almost certain backlash of what little Mac users remained, Emilio went with his one last option, Next Step. Since 1985, the company Next had made a name for itself by selling so-called 3M computers to higher educational markets. 3M standing for 1 megabyte of memory, 1 megapixel display resolution, and 1 megaflop of processing power. Next never was the most popular brand for the general public, but it was tied to some pretty famous successes in computing, such as being the first web server, as well as having the first web browser being written on it. The other big thing behind Next was its founder, Steve Jobs. Seeing that Next Step was exactly the operating system Apple was looking for, they bought out Next completely in December of 1996 and brought Jobs back into the company he had co-founded as an advisor. As for Copeland, the project was officially cancelled in favor of porting Next Step over to the Macintosh, 
The process of doing so was going to take a while, though. And in the interim, Apple bought up a bunch of third-party extensions for System 7 to incorporate them into the operating system, as well as working on improving stability in System 7.6. Given some more time, features like customizable themes and a multi-threaded finder, originally slated for Copeland, would make their way into macOS 8. And even later, macOS 8 did see some simplistic support for the preemptive multitasking system that had prompted the development of Copeland to begin with. macOS 9, released in 1999, brought more improvements to various elements of the Macintosh operating system. But more importantly, it marked the start of Apple's transition to their new Next architecture, introducing libraries like Carbon that would be used in the new macOS. Subsequent versions were designed with virtualization in mind, so that compatible programs could still be run on the new macOS architecture. And in 2001, it happened. macOS 10 was ready for its debut, and after nearly a decade of planning Apple's next generation OS, after the failed deals with IBM, after the disastrous internal politics of mid-90s Apple, and after buying out Next and shaking up the leadership, the OS had finally shipped. And the general response was? Eh. Apple had made great strides with revamping the OS with the Darwin kernel, beautifying the user interface through the new Aqua system theme, adding new UI elements like the dock, all while still supporting Mac OS 9 software through virtualization. At the same time though, OS X had poor support for external hardware out of the box. Some found the UI changes to be less intuitive than Mac OS 9, and the flashy new Aqua theme and effects tended to make the OS somewhat unresponsive on older hardware. Some were skeptical of the improvements in Mac OS X, with Jeff Raskin, an original Mac team member, calling it nothing more than a facelift. Generally, many users decided to wait it out until the OS matured. Jobs himself had to counter this concern by throwing a mock funeral for Mac OS 9 at the 2002 conference urging developers to move on to only OS X development. He worked tirelessly on our behalf, always hosting our applications, never refusing a command, always at our beck and call, except occasionally when he forgot who he was and needed to be restarted. Given a few years of evolution and, more importantly, more powerful generations of Macs to support the increasingly demanding operating system, OS X caught on, receiving nearly annual updates to this day. Copeland was far from just a failure, and OS X was far from just a rewrite. In fact, many of the side projects shoehorned into Copeland did eventually become programs on OS X, like video chatting, which would become FaceTime, and desktop search programs like Spotlight. Even the Apple Newton, a portable product at the same time as Copeland was being developed, would be reworked into the handwriting recognition program Inkwell. Jobs had said at the launch of OS X that the technology behind the new Mac OS would be able to support it for 20 years to come. Nearly 20 years later, that prediction has become more or less true. While the OS has gone through 13 iterations already, at the end of the day, it's still Mac OS X. And if you think about it, OS X has actually been around and supported for longer than the original first 9 versions of Mac OS combined. 